Esto es. ¿El streaming en qué momento empieza? Ya ha empezado. Estamos ahora mismo en el aire. ¿Es it work? Ya. Yes. Yes. Uh, ¿Ella? Works two out. <laughs> Welcome, everybody. As you know, the title of this workshop is Fine Tuning Anthropics and the String Landscape. Some uh, of our colleagues uh, uh, would find this title provocative. Particularly, the word anthropic sounds horrible to many physicists. On the other hand, more and more colleagues are now considering that, well, that these issues must be addressed scientifically, not uh, with emotions or tastes. Um, and this is uh, the purpose of uh, this workshop. We want to contribute uh, uh, in scientific terms to the discussion of these uh, uh, problems, which are becoming more and more uh, crucial with the new LAC and uh, uh, cosmological data. No more words. Uh, I introduced uh, the first chairman, which is Chaume Garriga, uh, who's here. Who will introduce the first speaker. OK, so uh, welcome, everybody, to this corner of the landscape. Um, our first speaker is a uh, world famous uh, Alan Guth, uh, who needs uh, no introduction. So <laughs> <laughs> that's why, yeah. Okay. And he's going to talk about uh, eternal inflation and the measure problem. Okay. Uh, let me just say at the outset uh, that if you are hoping that I would say something new about the measure problem. Uh, you're going to have to reduce your expectations. Uh, I actually don't have anything new to say about the measure problem, uh, but I do think it's one of the most important problems we face in cosmology. Uh, so I thought I would talk about it, really pretty much to just lay out the problems uh, to make sure that we're all kind of on the same page about what the problems are and what we currently know about the lack of uh, knowledge about this. Uh, so let me start at the beginning uh, describing what eternal inflation is about. Uh, essentially all models, not quite all I suppose, but essentially all models are uh, eternal uh, and more strictly speaking we're talking about future eternal. Uh, these models do not appear to be eternal going back into the past. Uh, there are theorems that at least almost say that that's impossible. Uh, but once inflation starts, uh, it never stops in these models. And the crude explanation is simply that the uh, inflating state uh, is essentially a metastable state. Um, so it decays, and you might think, therefore, inflation would end. Uh, but the problem is it doesn't decay as fast as it expands, and they're both exponential processes. So if you're exponentially decaying and exponentially expanding and the expansion is faster, uh, it means that the volume of the inflating region increases with time rather than decreases. And uh, once that starts happening, it just keeps happening. And at least in the context of these models, um, there's nothing to ever stop it. So inflation goes on forever. Uh, what happens is this... Uh, inflating state does decay, but it decays locally in places. Uh, every place it decays, it essentially starts a big bang and what we call a pocket universe. Uh, so you produce ultimately an infinite number of these pocket universes, uh, and it goes on ad infinitum. Uh, in slightly more detail, uh, there are basically two kinds of inflation, although you can break it up in finer gradations than that. Uh, one is what is called small field or sometimes new inflation. The original word was new inflation. And that's a case where the inflation takes place where a scalar field is perched on the top of a plateau in a potential energy diagram. And that state is definitely metastable. Uh, the, you can calculate the probability that the scalar field will remain on the top of the hill as a function of time, and it falls off exponentially. Uh, there's always still some probability that the scalar field will remain on the top. Uh, and again, the exponential, at least in working models of inflation, is generically uh, much slower than the exponential of the expansion. Uh, so again, the volume of the false vacuum 
uh, grows indefinitely with time. And this was pointed out originally in a paper by Paul Steinhardt and a, another paper by Alex Valenkin, uh, both in 1983. Uh, these papers are not really equivalent. Uh, Steinhardt regarded it as kind of an eccentricity, uh, while I think Valenkin understood correctly that it's a generic feature of these kinds of models of inflation. Uh, in what is sometimes called chaotic or large field inflation, uh, Andre Linde showed in 1986 that these models are also eternal. It's much less obvious in this case. Uh, you would think that the scalar field, if it's rolling down the hill as the inflation is taking place, would inevitably get to the bottom of the hill uh, and inflation would end. Uh, but what Andre realized is that if you take into account quantum fluctuations of the field, um, then that's not actually the case. And there's a very simple model of these quantum fluctuations. Um, the, uh, you could think of uh, everything happening in Hubble time steps. So you could think about averaging the field over Hubble volume to know what you're talking about and talking about how it evolves from one Hubble time to the next. And from one Hubble time to the next, uh, a pretty good model is that the scalar field evolves classically, uh, but then there's an addition to quantum mechanical jump due to quantum uncertainties, uh, which is about h over 2 pi. Uh, so we have classical motion plus these random increments. And what those random increments allow is the possibility that you could find a place on this hill uh, where the probability of jumping up uh, is at least uh, 1 20th, which means 1 over e cubed. Uh, e cubed is significant because if we're talking about one Hubble time, the universe expands by a factor of e linearly and therefore a factor of e cubed in volume, and that's about 20. Uh, so you could think of the universe breaking up into about 20 independent regions every Hubble time. And if you could arrange for just more than one of those to have a higher value of scale, the scalar field than you started with, uh, then the number of regions with the values of scalar field that high will grow exponentially with time uh, rather than shrink. And you get the same kind of phenomena uh, that we talked about before. Uh, what that leads to is a picture of a multiverse and this is a picture where we're really only taking into account uh, tunneling by bubbles. There's also stochastic evolution of scalar fields, which is harder to visualize. And it's not completely clear which of these is most important uh, under any circumstances, really. But if you just have bubbles, what I have here is just a space-time diagram, space left, right, time going forward. Uh, and I've taken out the scale factor. So this is a picture in co-moving coordinates. And that means that when a bubble forms, uh, the walls go outward at the speed of light, but because we've taken the scale factor out of this picture, the speed of light looks like it's becoming more and more vertical uh, as you go up on the diagram because of the difference in the scale factor. Uh, so one has bubbles forming inside of bubbles. Bubbles that form later look a lot smaller on the diagram because of the difference in the scale factor between the bottom of the diagram and the top of the diagram, although actually it, it doesn't matter. It's really time translation invariant. Uh, the bubbles are the same size no matter when they form, although the ones that form earlier get bigger. Uh, but this bubble, when it forms, is the same size as that bubble when it forms. Uh, so this is qualitatively what the picture of the multiverse would look like if you take into account only uh, bubble nucleation. And it's a perfectly good model as far as being able to illustrate all of the problems that we have in understanding eternal inflation, although it may not be a completely accurate model. Uh, this leads to problems in defining probabilities, which is this measure problem, which was the uh, part of the title of my talk. Uh, the key issue is that in an eternally inflating universe, anything that's allowed by the laws of physics to happen at all will ultimately happen an infinite number of times. Uh, and therefore, if you're trying to decide uh, what it means to say that some kinds of events are more likely than other kinds of events, uh, you're comparing infinities necessarily. And there is no simple, natural, automatic way to compare infinities. And that's the basic problem. A famous example that people often give to illustrate uh, the difficulties in comparing infinities uh, is to just think about the integers and ask the simple question, what fraction of the positive integers are odd? And usually you think of them as odd, even, odd, even, odd, even. And you say, obviously, half of them are odd and half of them are even. Uh, and that's certainly the natural thing to say in the standard ordering of the integers. Uh, but if you don't necessarily know the ordering of the objects that you're talking about here, 
Uh, then you can imagine rearranging the same infinite set of integers, uh, starting with the first two odd ones, then taking the first even one, two, then taking the next two odd ones, five and seven, then the next even integer, four, then the next two odds, and you can continue that forever, uh, and every integer will occur exactly once and only once, so you've not changed the set of integers you're talking about. It's the very same set you're always accustomed to, but if you write them in this order, it sure looks like two-thirds of them uh, are odd, and you can define a measure for which that's literally true, but, um, and that's the ambiguity. You really can't tell what fraction of the integers are even unless you have an ordering, and in the multiverse, we don't really have an ordering. Uh, Time might be thought of as an ordering, but as you know, in a general relativistic situation, there are many different definitions of time, uh, and they don't give equivalent results. Uh, so it's possible to define probabilities uh, in an eternally inflating universe by imposing some kind of a cutoff, and that's what we normally attempt to do. Uh, but the issue is that the answers one finds uh, often depend on the type of cutoff, and in some cases very strongly on the type of cutoff uh, that you use to pick out the region that you're going to use to sample this infinite uh, space. Uh, so uh, the simplest kind of measure uh, turns out not to work, which is a little surprising. Uh, the simplest measure is called proper time cutoff. And uh, to describe that in detail, you can imagine choosing some arbitrary initial space-like surface called here sigma sub i. Uh, and then you can construct a family of geodesics which start out normal to that surface, which then sweep out a region of space-time. Uh, and you could follow each geodesic for some fixed proper time, which is a natural invariant, and undoubtedly the first thing anybody would try. Uh, and then you could cut it off uh, at some sigma final after you followed each of these geodesics for some proper time tau sub c. Uh, that picks out a finite space-time region, which we can call our sample space-time region, and within that sample space-time region, which is by construction finite, uh, we can talk about the ratio of one type of event to another. We can talk about how common it is to have triplets versus single births, whatever you, question you want to ask. Uh, and then once you find that ratio, you can take the limit as tau sub c goes to infinity and expect that you're really learning something about the multiverse. Um, and you are, uh, but nonetheless, uh, this method of defining probabilities uh, fails badly for a reason which I'll tell you about in a minute. But first, let's just point out that, uh, uh, let's see, one, one proviso in constructing it, which is what this first item is here, uh, sometimes certain regions, even though the space-time is eternally inflating, certain regions may just collapse to singularities. They can basically find themselves inside a black hole. If that happens to you for the surface that you chose, if it lies, falls entirely into a black hole, then you just choose another surface and, and try again. And the belief is that as long as you find something that does ultimately grow to become infinitely large, it will sample the space-time the, the same as any other choice that you might have made. Uh, this kind of measure strongly favors large amounts of inflation, uh, and in fact is dominated by the fastest inflating state, which grows exponentially and dominates uh, the volume in this measure. Uh, what's wrong with the measure? is uh, something called the youngness problem. Um, and the youngness problem is related directly to this incredibly rapid exponential expansion. Uh, the exponential expansion of this system is dominated by the fastest exponentially expanding piece. Uh, whatever kind of false vacuum-like state exponentially expands the fastest, which is presumably something at, say, the gut scale, uh, with an expansion time of maybe 10 to the minus 37 seconds or something like that. Uh, so every 10 to the minus 37 seconds, the total volume of this multiverse uh, will grow by a factor of e. Uh, and, th and that's incredibly fast. And because it's exponential, and this is really the crux of this youngness problem, uh, because the growth is exponential, uh, with exponential growth, most of the space-time volume is always within a few Hubble times of the end. Uh, and therefore, a few times 10 to the minus 37 seconds of the end. So if you look at the set of sample pocket universes that you see, um, it's extraordinarily dominated by the youngest of those, where the ones that are just a few times 10 to the minus 37 seconds old dominate. Uh, if you look at ones that are a little older, by
10 to the minus 37 seconds. They're down by a factor of E. Another 10 to the minus 37 seconds older, they're down by another factor of E. And by the time you're talking about a universe that's uh, 14 billion years old, you're down by many, many factors of E relative to the volume at the peak. Uh, so the sample is incredibly biased towards very young universes. And a sample number was uh, suggested by Max Tegmark in a paper he wrote where he referred to this as the coolness problem because he was looking at the temperature of the cosmic background radiation. Uh, if there are many more young universes than old, that should make it more probable that we live in a very young universe and therefore one with a higher temperature of the cosmic background radiation. And uh, as a sample calculation, uh, Max compared uh, the 2.78 degrees that we live at compared to 4 degrees Kelvin and discovered with sample numbers associated with grand unified theory scale inflation uh, that the amount of volume available for civilizations to develop at 4K, because there are so many more of these younger universes, is larger than the amount of volume available for civilizations to develop at 2.7K. Uh, by a factor of 10 to the 10 to the 56th power. Uh, absolutely absurd. Uh, so if you think it's impossible for life to evolve at 4K, then there's no problem here. Uh, but if you think it's possible, but improbable, uh, as long as it's not so improbable that it overcomes this factor of 10 to the 10 to the 56, which is rather hard to overcome, uh, you'd expect to be much more likely to be living at 4K than 2.7K. But here we are at 2.7K, and the problem is how would you ever be there if this was the right measure? Uh, so most of us regard this as a fatal flaw of this proper time cutoff measure, and we consider the proper time cutoff measure to be ruled out. Uh, so you want to find a way to fix it, uh, and uh, one way to fix it is, so there are many ways to fix it, but one way to fix it, which is the one I'll talk about, is what's called scale factor cutoff measure. Uh, which is a similar construction, uh, except that you use a different time variable. Uh, there is no really unique time variable in general relativity, so this one is also a perfectly sensible thing to do, although I think it's definitely not the first thing that you would try, which I think would be proper time for just about all of us. <clears throat> the scale factor cutoff time is defined by the expansion of the universe. Uh, so one way of uh, making that concrete is to imagine, uh, again, choosing an initial space-like surface. And you can imagine on that initial space-like surface uh, sprinkling a fictitious dust, which initially has zero velocity on that surface. Uh, and you can then follow those dust particles. Uh, they don't really exist. They're just hypothetical constructions. Uh, but you, they follow geodesics by definition. And you can follow how they behave. And as the space expands, the dust thins out. And you can use the density of the dust as your measure of the local expansion. Uh, remember, we want to do things locally. It's not just one global scale factor we're interested in. It's a complicated, lumpy multiverse. Uh, but it, you could follow the dust and just define uh, the time in terms of the dust, saying that the dust expands. Uh, essentially with a Hubble constant that's sort of defined to be 1 with respect to this time variable. Uh, so you define the density of the dust to be uh, e to the minus 3, 3 being conventional, uh, times the scale factor time. Uh, and then you do the same construction, but you cut off with scale factor time instead of uh, cutting off uh, with uh, proper time. Uh, if you do this, you find that there is a, a very, very mild uh, youngness bias. Uh, but so mild that you don't care about it. There's no, no way to rule it out on this basis. It's a perfectly uh, plausible cutoff. Uh, so this is one way of getting around um, the problem with the proper time cutoff. It leads to rather different phenomenology. Uh, with this definition of time, all states expand at the same rate. It's e to the 3t for, for any state. Uh, so it no longer favors rapidly expanding st st kinds of material. Uh, Materials do, however, decay, uh, which is not compensated for by the way we've redefined time. Uh, so the states that decay the slowest are the ones that dominate uh, in this measure. So it gives really a very different picture uh, of what's probable uh, in the multiverse. Um, OK, now I'd like to just shift gears a bit. I've shown you two measures, and that's all I'm going to show you. There are many more. Uh, but these are just samples to give you an idea of what kinds of things are considered. Uh, I now want to talk about other ways of uh, critiquing measures. Uh, 
uh, other ways of finding out that some measures might not work, and then we're left with other measures that do. So I've mentioned the youngness problem, which uh, completely rules out, we believe, uh, the proper time cutoff measure. Another issue concern involved in testing measures is uh, the issue of Boltzmann brains. Uh, and the easiest way to see how, what kind of a problem Boltzmann brains could be is we could imagine a measure which just focuses on our own pocket and just takes everything that we ha happens in our own pocket up to a given time uh, as our sample volume uh, with which to define probabilities. That measure is ruled out by the Boltzmann brain problem, as I will now try to explain. Um, let's imagine that our vacuum is either stable or more likely it, it's unstable. Uh, but if it's unstable, it probably has a nucleation rate which is low enough so that we're not lucky that it has not already decayed. It probably should be uh, reasonable that the universe has not already decayed. Uh, and that means that the nucleation rate, which is a rate per volume per time, uh, should be small compared to the Hubble constant to the fourth power. That would guarantee that we're not too likely to have decayed yet. So I'm going to assume that that's the case. Uh, if that's the case, even though our vacuum is unstable on this vision, uh, it will still inflate eternally. Uh, it will decay in places. New, new bubbles would nucleate within our own space. Uh, but they, the nucleation of the new bubbles would be outpaced uh, by the expansion of the background that we are moving into a de Sitter phase where our universe is starting to exponentially expand. And that's what I'm talking about. Um, so ultimately, we will go into a de Sitter phase, uh, which will go on forever. Decays will continue to happen, but the decays will never take up the majority of the volume of our universe. Um, an important point about the Sitter space is that it has a non-zero temperature, analogous to the temperature of black holes. In this case, it's called a Gibbons Hawking temperature, because those were the authors of the original paper. Uh, and it's the Hubble expansion rate divided by 2 pi. Uh, now, the important thing about a thermal ensemble, which is what this vacuum looks like, is that in, an, in a thermal ensemble, essentially anything can happen, uh, just with a small probability if the energy required by that thing is large compared to kT. Uh, so you expect essentially anything to happen uh, with a probability proportional to e to the minus the total mass of that thing uh, divided by this Gibbons Hawking temperature, which of course is incredibly low for our universe. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, anything that uh, is physically possible will happen with these kinds of probabilities, and we're going to have an infinite amount of space-time volume of de Sitter space in our future. That's the key here. That this eternal inflation leads to infinities in space-time volumes. Uh, so that means that even though the probability of uh, something is very small, it will still happen an infinite number of times if you wait. So in particular, these Boltzmann brains are brains that are like ours, uh, which you could imagine just nucleating spontaneously as thermal fluctuations in the future de Sitter evolution of our pocket universe. Uh, so in particular, for every real Alan Goose, to pick an example of a living being, uh, there will be an infinite number of Boltzmann brains who will, in fact, think they're Alan Guth. Uh, and they will share exactly all of my memories and all of my thought processes. Uh, the probability of that, of course, again, is incredibly low, but you have an infinite space-time volume uh, to allow these things to happen in. Uh, so uh, the conclusion, then, is that with overwhelming probability, with this way of looking at probabilities, uh, the Boltzmann brains who share my memories um, will not realize that they're any different from me, except that the world that they're viewing will rapidly disappear, since it never existed. They were just thermal fluctuations that, by random choice, their neurons have been set with my own memories. But the objects that these Boltzmann brains remember don't actually exist. So sooner or later, in fact, in general, very soon, uh, the Boltzmann brains will notice that they don't really have a world, a world around them. Uh, so the conclusion that I'd like to reach is that the fact that I have continued to see the world evolve normally uh, for a long time, and uh, even during this talk, a long amount of time has gone by by these standards. Uh, so the continued existence of this coherent world that we see uh, is strong evidence that we are not Boltzmann brains, and therefore strong evidence that we do not live in a universe uh, with a measure for which, would, which would predict that we would be overwhelmingly likely to be Boltzmann brains. Uh, so my claim is that this kind of a measure is ruled out uh, by this Boltzmann brain argument. Um, with regard to specific measures, uh, proper time cutoff has no problem with Boltzmann brains. It has the opposite problem. Uh, 
Late times are strongly suppressed in the proper time measure, which is the ugliest problem, the opposite problem, really. Uh, for the scale factor cutoff measure, which I advertised as OK, uh, that actually produces a, a, a fixed ratio, not an infinite ratio, but a finite ratio of Boltzmann brains to normal observers, which you can calculate. It depends on nucleation rates, which you have no good way of estimating. Uh, so the bottom line for the scale factor cutoff measure, I think, is that we don't really know if it's acceptable or not. But it does mean, as far as we know, it's acceptable. So the attitude we usually take here, or at least I usually take, is that a measure is innocent until proven guilty. Um, so the Boltzmann brain problem does not rule out scale factor cutoff measure, although in the future it could if we learn better how to calculate these things. <coughs> okay, I'm going to skip this for I think I'm running out of time. Um, do want to mention uh, a weird phenomenon that happens in many of these measures uh, called the time delay bias. Uh, and it really happens in any global cutoff measure. Uh, and you can see it as just a feature of the exponential expansion. So let's just imagine uh, an exponentially expanding civilization where the civilization we have in mind, at least in the back of our minds, the idea that we're talking about the uh, population of the multiverse. And just as a sort of very toy example, uh, suppose that there's a bell that rings every time there's a birth. Uh, and the bell has two tones, or two bells with different tones, uh, a low tone for boys and a high tone for girls. Uh, and suppose further that there's equal numbers of boys and girls, approximately. We'll say exactly in our toy model. Uh, then, if there's no other complications, you'd expect to hear, on average, equal numbers of low rings and high rings. Um, and if you ask, what's the probability that the next ring is going to be high or low, it would be 50-50. However, now, let's add a complication. Uh, let's suppose that the high tone for girls is only rung after some time delay, uh, while the tone for boys is rung immediately. Now, when you hear a high tone, it refers not to a birth that just happened, but to a birth that happened this time delay amount of time earlier. And because our universe is exponentially expanding, the universe at an earlier time was smaller. So there are fewer births that happened sometime delta t ago than are happening now. Uh, so that will suppress the ringing of the bell at the high tone. And if you imagine this bell going off, you will now hear many more uh, low tones than high tones. Uh, simply because of the time delay. And because you're hearing many more low tones than high tones, if you were to ask what's the probability that the next tone I hear will be low, it will be more than a half. Uh, there'll be a bias uh, simply caused by the time delay and the ringing of the bell uh, at the high tone. Uh, a time delay in reporting the results of this particular experiment. So in any experiment, the bottom line is, uh, if different experimental results are reported with different time delays, that biases the probabilities in favor of the shorter time delay. And this really is actually an instance of the, something very similar to the youngness paradox that we talked about earlier. Uh, so I think um, uh, my take is that one has to simply accept this. It really is a property of any global time cutoff measure. Uh, of course, for something like scale factor cutoff measure, it's a very, very mild effect that you would never, ever see. Uh, but in principle, it's there. Uh, and for something like proper time measure, it would be a big effect. Okay, uh, that means 25 minutes have gone by, or 20 minutes have gone by, 25 minutes have gone by. Okay, I will finish very, very quickly. Uh, let me just say that the uh, status of the measure problem is that I think we still do not know really how to define probabilities in eternally inflating universes. Uh, we can construct measures that give reasonable answers, uh, but what we've not found is any general principle uh, that determines uh, the correct measure. Um, and uh, I would say that it's likely that what we'll need ultimately is some deeper understanding of quantum gravity or something to solve this problem, because at the level of just looking at classical probabilities, there doesn't <coughs> seem to be an answer. And uh, a number of people have been staring at it for a long time now, and nobody has found an answer in, in that context. Uh, let me take one more minute to close quickly. Um, I, I just want to give you some quotes, which I think are interesting, on just the question of how real is the multiverse. Some of you may have heard these quotes before, but they're very, very cute. Um, uh, Martin Rees, uh, astronomer royal of Great Britain, former president of Royal Society, et cetera, et cetera, uh, said at a conference a while ago when he was asked uh, that he's sufficiently confident about the multiverse uh, to bet his dog's life on it. Uh. 
Uh, now, Andre Linde, who some of you may know is a big enthusiast of the multiverse, was at the same conference, and he immediately said that he's so confident uh, that he would bet his own life on it. Uh, now, Steve Weinberg uh, is a person who I consider to be a very sensible person, uh, who was not at this conference, but commented on it later in something that he wrote. Uh, and he said that I have just enough confidence about the multiverse to bet, can you guess? Some of you may know, uh, the lives of both Andre Linde and Martin Lisa's <laughs> dog. I like that quote. Thank you. Uh, any questions for Alan? In what sense, more precisely, would you think that the understanding of quantum gravity would help?